as, uh, as Chris introduced uh, me, I'm, I'm Martin Brown. I've uh, been going into the Repair Cafe until COVID came along, of course. Um, Chris says I've got loads of experience, but I've learned an awful lot off Kirill there. Uh, Kirill really knows how to fix stuff. Um, he's got the he's got the um, Russian approach to fixing things, and something I learned to, when I was in the corporate world was that, you know, if you're in Russia, you have to fix it because you're not going to be able to get the parts. And in any case, if you get the parts, they're six thousand miles away. That sort of stuff. So I learned quite a lot of Kirill. Um, I mentioned the corporate world. Um, my background is uh, I was started off as an electronic engineer. Um, got involved in power electronics, which uh, you know was quite a new thing in those days. Then I drifted into customer support um, and customer service, and I finally ended up doing technical training. So, um, uh, and we were also we were also doing um, I won't say pioneering, but we were doing uh, training over the web uh, relatively early on. Um, so. Um, Anything that is faulty and rubbishy is purely um, my experience, um, you know, not, not showing through, should we say. So um, let's hope it works out okay. So the purpose of today really is to um, sort of start off with talking about electricity uh, as an introduction um, and see if we can sort of clarify a few of the myths and misunderstandings and then look at the way it works in your house and then towards the end, um, we'll just, look, just sort of introduce the idea of how you can repair stuff. Um, as Chris says, it's not a, it's not a, I'm not, you know, I'm not sending people away to fix stuff left, right and centre, but just give the idea that it's possible to do this. I think that's the, that's the main thing. So I'm going to uh, share my screen now. If I can find the right screen. Um, let's try that one. Right, can... Uh, can you see the uh, the screen there? That's looking good. Okay, so um, this is the the first point in the presentation. Then electricity, energy, and how things work. So here's what I want to talk about: um, basic electricity, how what we understand by electricity, um, measuring it, generating it, using it in the home, um, and then the different sorts of power that we use in the home, because that's something else that is never clear. And then just briefly an introduction to fixing stuff. And as Chris says, we might want to do a bit more of that perhaps later. Okay, um, so getting started then, what's electricity? Electricity is a flow of electrons. You've got your atoms with their electrons uh, sort of uh, orbiting around them. And uh, some of the atoms have got uh, quite a few electrons freely moving in the outer shell that can move from one to the other. Pretty much uh, most of the metals are like that actually. So um, if, there's a, if there's a bit of a force to move them, the electrons will flow uh, up through, the, uh, through the metals. So that's where you get a conductor from. It's something that allows electricity to flow. Um, in other materials, um, then the electrons are much harder to move. Um, and these are what we know as insulators. Um, obviously, there's a, uh, a group in between, the semiconductors, which are neither um, conductors or insulators, but um, we won't touch on those too much. Um, it's a bit complicated to explain how those work. That's another way of saying I don't understand it, but uh, we'll come on to that. So electricity, a flow of electrons, uh, and we just need a bit of uh, sort of energy to get them moving. So if you make a circuit, um, uh, if you want to make a, a if you want to make something use electricity, you, you need to have a circuit. You need to have a complete link right the way around to make uh, the uh, the electricity flow. It can't flow through if there's a space, if there's a gap in the way. So that's why you've always got two wires running around uh, where you've got electricity. So in this example, we've got a little battery. We've got a wire going through a switch and then it comes through an old fashioned light bulb, uh, which has got a, a, a wire that gets hot when electricity goes through it. And in the case of the battery, the battery produces electricity by a chemical reaction. Sometimes that's a reversible reaction, which means you can recharge the battery. Sometimes it isn't, and then you have to chuck away the battery and get a new one. So that's sort of the, what it looks like when you wire it up on the bench. This is how engineers tend to draw it. They draw a battery as two plates. 
they draw a light, something like this, and then we've got a switch that at this moment is open, and if we close the switch, then the bulb lights up because there's a circuit now which the electricity can flow through. So key thing about electricity is it needs to have this circuit to make it happen. It needs to have a connection from the source of the, uh, the power right through to the load, in this case, the light bulb. Now, I talked about um, the need to push the power through the, uh, the circuit, and it's voltage that does the pushing. It creates a potential difference. It's all due to certain areas being short of electrons and other areas having excessive electrons, if you want. And uh, the battery voltage we measure in volts, needless to say, and that volt level is the potential difference. So it's called a potential difference because until you connect something to it, nothing happens. So it's waiting there with potential. So the plug on the wall has got potential, i.e. voltage, uh, but it's not doing anything until you plug something into it. So you can look at the voltage, if you want, as the pressure, what's going to push the electron flow around. Quite often we use a water analogy and we say voltage is like a pressure. So the greater the voltage, the more push you've got, but it doesn't do anything until you actually make a circuit. So the voltage pushes the electrons through the, the bulb and we talk about a current flowing. Okay, It's spelt with an E, not like a black current or a red current or anything like that. It's a current like a water current. And the current flows by convention from positive to negative. Actually, the electrons flow in the other way, but that's not important right now, as they say. We just think about current flowing from positive to negative. And we measure current in amperes, named after a French guy, I think, uh, shortens to amps or A. And if we're writing equations, we'll write it with an I. But uh, current flow, positive to negative, um, as I say, uh, current measured in amperes. And with voltage and current, you'll find that there's lots of different, uh, you can talk about uh, milliamps uh, or microamps when you're dealing with electronics. And in volts, you can talk about kilovolts or megavolts. You can talk about kiloamps as well, but it's not quite so common. So we can, uh, we can measure voltage and current. Uh, there's a very wide range that we can, we can work with. But most of the time, we're working with uh, numbers that are sort of more familiar, two, 300 volts, uh, four, five, 10 amps, that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's the basis of electricity of, uh, of uh, uh, when you're working from a battery. So I mentioned that we use a water analogy, we talk about voltage is the pressure and current being the flow. Well, the power is the pressure times the flow. If you think of it, if we go back to the water analogy, you've got a dam, there's a lot of pressure there, but until you open the sluices, there's, there's no power being generated. And if you only have a little, if you only have a little trickle of, uh, of flow, you're not getting much power. It's the combination of the flow and the pressure. And it's the same with electricity. The voltage uh, is the pressure, the current is the flow, voltage times the current, conveniently gives us power in watts, named after the great Scotsman, James Watt, of course. So uh, we talk about watts being the power. And again, we have different levels, uh, different levels of voltage, uh, different levels of, of watts, kilowatts, etc. Um, remember, um, I mentioned the water analogy again, but unlike water, we have to have a circuit. We always have to have this circuit to make the power flow around. OK, so we've introduced you to the idea of power uh, measured in watts. Um, watts are relatively small if we start looking at the real world and we start getting into kilowatts, which are a thousand watts, megawatts, a million watts, and gigawatts, which is a thousand million watts, um, or a thousand megawatts, or however. How does this apply in the real world? Well, I've got a picture of an old fashioned kettle here, um, proper old Russell Hobbs, um, British made kettle. And uh, so typically this will work from 240 volts. That's the voltage that comes out your socket and uh, it draws about 10 amps of, uh, of current. So we can calculate the power, voltage times current, 2,400 watts, 2.4 kilowatts. 
So um, 2.4 kilowatts, you can boil a couple of pints of water um, in a couple of minutes, as you know, when you make your tea. But that's fine for sort of domestic things. Um, but if we get into the real world, uh, you know, the manufacturing world, where we've got uh, these big steel mill motors, for instance, then we often work with a higher voltage and a lot more current, and we work up towards over over a thousand kilowatts or about 1.1 megawatts typically for these big motors that are uh, um, rolling the steel as it comes out of the plant so you know you can see how in industry we can very rapidly build up to quite uh, high quite big electricity bills without even uh, even thinking about it now where does all this electricity come from well we generate it uh, in different sorts of ways. We have the old fashioned way, I suppose, is with the big power stations. And in the 80s uh, and 90s, we built a lot of gas fired power stations because they're the most efficient, basically. Uh, and typical power station will produce something like 1,500 or 2,000 megawatts, about 1.7 or even two gigawatts. So a lot of power coming out of a, a, a gas power station. Um, and all the power stations we have uh, all add up together and if you run all the power stations all the renewable systems everything that gives us a total generating capacity in the uk of about 80 gigawatts that's about 80,000 megawatts um, the maximum demand in the uk and i always think that's going to be on a cold dark cloudy um, January morning where all the factories are switching on and everybody's still got their lights on and all the offices and everyone's got their heating running. Typical maximum uh, um, load is about 63,000 megawatts, 63 um, gigawatts. Um, so it's very important that the generating capacity always exceeds the maximum load because at the moment anyway it's very difficult to store electricity. It's one of the great challenges we have is finding a way of storing electricity. Um, so uh, uh, that's why we always have to have a little bit of reserve between 63 and 80. So that's very quickly in a nutshell how our power system uh, works to, uh, to provide that. When we, measure, when we measure power and energy, uh, we measure power, as we just discussed, in watts and kilowatts and things, but energy is power for the amount of time that we use it. Obviously, uh, we don't need much energy to boil water because we only, in a kettle, because we only do it for a couple of minutes. But if we do it for a long time, we use a lot more energy. So we measure energy in, in kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, gigawatt hours, and even terawatt hours. So, uh, it's the it's the number of watts times the amount of time that we use it for and with electricity it's usually kilowatt hours or this sort of uh, this sort of uh, unit there are other units when you're doing your physics and things so boil the kettle for an hour uh, you'll burn the element out or you'll steam up the kitchen or something but you'll use 2.4 kilowatt hours of electricity and typically that'll cost you something like 20 or 30 pence. And we'll talk a bit more about the cost of, uh, of electricity and what uses power and what doesn't. Um, your house might use something like 50 kilowatt hours a week. Um, if you sort of add up all the kettles you boil and the, the ovens you run and the lights you switch on, typically 50 kilowatts uh, hours a week. That's sort of, I don't know, six, seven, eight pounds worth of electricity. Um, I suppose might use a bit more. I don't know. I have to think about what my electricity bill is. Um, if you've got solar panels on your roof, you might generate about 3,000 kilowatt hours over a year. So you can see that um, it's sort of getting on for covering what you're what you're using. Um, but uh, you know that's uh, problem is it only works during the when the sun's out. Of course. And finally, if you add up all the power that's used in the UK, all the, all the uh, energy, it comes up to about 360 terawatt hours. So that's, so that's about 1,000 gigawatt hours a day, looking at it, one terawatt hour a day. So it's quite a lot of power. 
So however you look at it, if you're supplying the UK with energy, you need quite a few power stations, quite a few, few renewable systems, or a combination of those. And uh, we can talk about sort of how the grid works and things um, maybe in another session. So that's all our electricity. Why is it dangerous? Um, you know, we've talked about it as a, as a great source of energy. Well, I just want to emphasize at this point that, you know, it can be dangerous. Basically, our um, bodies operate on electricity. The signals that run around um, are signals that run around our body have got electricity uh, controlling them. So a shock, an electric shock, where you actually get a current through your body. Remember, you can have as much voltage as you like. That's not the problem. The problem is when the current flows. When, uh, when current flows, uh, it can upset the operation of the heart. And that's why um, if somebody's had a heart attack, you can give them an electric shock and restart the heart. That's how defibrillation works. And that's why you have these great, um, these great dramas when people put electrodes on the chest and say, stand clear and all that. Large amounts of electrical energy can destroy the body. So if you get a very severe shock of a power system, the actual current that flows through you can, uh, can damage you. Um, won't get into the detail of that because it's pretty gruesome, but um, it's, uh, it's uh, not nice. So as it says here, high voltage is not dangerous in itself, it's the current that flows. Um, and that's true because if you, if you um, muck about with these electrostatic um, van der Graaff generators and things, I don't know if they still let you do that at school, but you can make your hair stand on them, but there's very, very little current. But the voltage is very high um, on these systems. Okay, so that's a sort of quick rough introduction to um, how electricity works uh, and how our um, and how we measure it and what the volts and the amps and the uh, the watts and the kilowatts and the kilowatt hours are. Um, I hope that's fairly clear. Um, the next bit I'm going to talk about AC and DC, the difference uh, between direct current and uh, and alternating current. Any questions or, or vital uh, points to bring up on that? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll press on then. Up to now, I've talked about DC, um, which um, most conveniently comes out of a battery. And with DC, you just get a steady voltage over time. It doesn't change. And this is called direct current. I mean, it's a voltage really, but uh, by the time it flows, it will be a current. So it's direct or straight forward current, you might say. And just to be clear on this, of course, if you've got a battery, it runs down over time and the voltage um, runs fairly steadily and then starts dropping off right at the end. Uh, didn't want to confuse and think that uh, batteries last forever because they don't. However, as it says here, it's easier to generate and transmit uh, voltage and current uh, that's continuously changing. That is, instead of it being positive all the time or negative all the time from the battery, uh, we create a voltage that is rising and falling and then going and then reversing and going negative. So it goes positive, negative, positive and carries on like that. And that, of course, is called alternating current. It's actually, the, again, the voltage that's alternating until you actually draw the current. And the alternate, the, the rate of alterating, the rate of alternate, alternating is, uh, in, in this country, is 50 times a second. So we go positive and negative every 20 milliseconds. Uh, that is to say, 50 times a second. Uh, we used to talk about cycles per second in the past, but um, it's been replaced by Hertz, uh, who was a German physicist. So we now talk about 50 Hertz being the operating frequency. And if you go to the US um, you'll and certain other countries, you'll find they work at 60 Hertz. And um, it's a bit like driving on the left and driving on the right. We're sort of stuck with 50 Hertz and they're stuck with 60 Hertz. Um, and that's the way it is. But uh, 50 Hertz uh, is okay for Europe. And the, and the UK. Alternating current, continually changing from positive to negative. And one of the great advantages of that is that it's very easy to switch 
the voltage and the current up and down using transformers. Uh, and transformers aren't those things that change from cars to uh, nasty uh, monsters. They're actually pieces of electrical equipment that allow you to uh, switch the voltage higher or switch it lower, depending on what you need. So, uh, where do we use DC? Well, um, DC is, uh, going back to DC, DC is used uh, in battery operated systems because uh, batteries provide us with DC. So, uh, your torches, your cars, your cordless uh, tools, etc., cetera, um, all those kind of things, um, your phones, anything that's got a battery and is using DC at least to start with. Um, electronics and digital systems, these generally all work off um, of DC, relatively low voltage for electronics. So any piece of electronics you have probably gets its power from the mains, from the AC mains, and then sets it down or converts it to operate on DC. So your battery chargers, your phone chargers, your power supplies for laptops, they all take the AC and convert it to low voltage DC, usually to match up with, uh, with, with, with the battery that's, that's in the equipment. If you're doing electrochemistry, which is really what batteries are, then uh, you use DC, and smaller motors um, often use DC. I just put a picture here of um, a uh, aluminium smelter, because that's a piece of electro electrochemistry. Um, these are very, very serious pieces of equipment using 400,000 amps. Uh, and if you, the, the magnetic fields that these generate are quite interesting in terms of destroying uh, old analog watches and uh, interfering with cars and all that sort of thing. Um, but that's how you make aluminium, you use, you use electricity. And that's why aluminium smelters are often built next to, next to hydro plants, because they use that much power. That's an aside anyway. Um, AC, however, um, is, as I said, useful in power transmission, very easy to, uh, to move around the country or move around the world even uh, by changing the voltage as required. A lot of, as a consequence, a lot of domestic appliances and equipment are designed to work with, uh, with AC. Um, a lot of motors in industry uh, and, of course, the generators that produce the uh, electricity. So this is a 700 megawatt. Um, AC generator. So this is typically what you find in one of those power stations. Um, a couple of these uh, running to, to produce the power. Radio transmission, of course, is AC as well. Um, that, uh, that's how radio transmission works. But we'll, uh, we'll skip over radio transmission because that's another story. So AC and DC. Um, interestingly, there was a big argument when they first started making, uh, started using electricity a lot, and uh, people like Edison were great, were in favour of uh, DC, and people like Tesla were in favour of AC. Or it might have been the other way around. I can't remember. It was that way, and I believe uh, Edison um, uh, shocked an elephant to 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 prove how powerful it was. Yeah, um, there's, there were some interesting stories about Queen Victoria um, uh, being, you know, being allowed to touch DC plates, you know, uh, to demonstrate how safe electricity was. And it's just as well she didn't have her, have her uh, you know, uh, wet wellies on or something. Otherwise, history could have been very different um, still. So um, I mentioned about generating and uh, transmission of electricity. Um, and we talked about batteries giving you power, but um, the by far the best way of getting power is what's called the electromagnetic effect, which is effectively, uh, very simply, if you've got a magnetic field, and I've drawn a couple of magnets here, but you can use electromagnets as well. And if you, uh, and if you uh, start moving some conductors with a complete circuit, you've always got to have the circuit, remember, if we move a conductor in a magnetic field, it will make a current flow. And as you can see in this diagram, it'll force the current in one direction when it's close to this pole, and in the other direction when it's close to that pole. And by completing the circuit, it kind of adds up and makes the current flow. And they got a little meter, da little meter down there to show that we're, we're getting some volts coming out of it. And it's very, the, the, it's, 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 it's um, worth emphasizing that you have to move the conductor in the field. If you just leave it there, it won't do anything. It has to be motion there. So you can see that if we have some way of turning this around, we can generate 
um, electricity. The opposite is also true. If we have a source of electricity and we pass a current through it uh, in, in the magnetic field, the same sort of shape uh, will produce a force on the conductors and it will turn the, uh, it will uh, make the, uh, it will move the cables. Um, I say turn because usually this thing is on an axle and uh, it'll rotate. So we can, with, with, as long as we've got a magnetic field and as long as we've got the suitably arranged conductors, we can motor or we can generate uh, relatively easily. Um, and as a consequence, if we think about this, go back to those windings in those previous drawings, you can just about imagine that if we've got a magnetic field that's fixed and these are turning around, then as one conductor sweeps by the North Pole, it'll make it positive. And as it, that same conductor, when it gets round to the South Pole, it'll be negative. So just by rotating the conductor in the magnetic field, we produce this AC voltage, which can then generate a, a which will then make a current flow. So generating AC is pretty simple because you get this automatic reversal of, um, the, of, the, of the voltage as you rotate the conductor in the magnetic field. And that's exactly how the 700 megawatt AC generator works that we saw in the previous uh, couple of foils. So very simple to generate the, uh, the, the, the AC current that we want. And obviously we need to rotate this 50 times a second if we want to get 50 cycles, 50 hertz per second uh, for our generating system. If you want to generate DC, or conversely, if you want to have a, a DC motor, you need to have some form of switch that will continually switch the current so that it's always pushing in the same direction. And instead of, so instead of producing AC, it's sort of switched to make it into DC. And that switch is a rotary switch here, which we call a commutator. And it, the, the, uh, the current is picked up from brushes that connect onto that commutator. So with a DC machine, you've got brushes that spark around a bit that you, you might see on your electric drill, for instance, and that produces, uh, then, we get a, then we got a DC machine. The reason that uh, AC motors also have commutators is basically all about um, the economics of building those particular sorts of motors. It's cheaper to build what's called a universal motor than, produce a, than to produce a proper full AC motor. But we won't, we won't go into that too much. There's loads of different sorts of motor technology, which uh, even I don't begin to understand. Okay, so back to AC then. As I said earlier, we need these big machines, these 500 megawatt generators, uh, usually powered by steam. So these are steam turbines here and the generators at one end of it. Can't actually work it out now, but uh, um, they are pretty big. You can see the railings down here. Um, where people can get around. That's a conventional power station. I think the boilers are, are probably arranged along here. Um, all very big, all very, uh, all very, um, how shall I put it, um, uh, macho. That's the word I wanted, all very macho. However, of course, the trend now is to have distributed uh, smaller generation systems like these wind turbines. Um, Wind turbine sizes have been growing steadily um, over the last 20 years. Um, typical onshore wind turbines that you will see around Scotland are five megawatts maximum, uh, typical sizes, or they might be 3.3.5 megawatts. It's this kind of size. Um, and they're still pretty big when you get close up to them. And remember, this is the maximum that you get. If the winds blows too much or if it's blowing too little, you get less than the maximum power. Uh, you typically get somewhere between 20 and 30 percent uh, off a wind turbine uh, on average. So if you've got a five megawatt wind turbine, if you average over the year the power you'll get off, it might be something like a megawatt, a megawatt and a half on average. So you need quite a lot of wind turbines to replace a 500 megawatt generator. But of course, the economics of scale have made that uh, have now made that very feasible. Uh, the latest offshore units, by the way, are 12 megawatts, uh, and these uh, these units are just a few feet 
short of the height of the shard when they're fully erected. So when we say they're big, I mean they are seriously big. Um, these are big enough when you get close, but these, uh, these ones that are going offshore off Dogger Bank and East, East Moray um, are, uh, are very big. And, you know, we're beginning to really uh, match, the, uh, match the generating capacity of uh, the existing power stations now with the numbers of wind turbines. Okay, talked about the generating side of it. Won't go into the detail of it, but you need a very complex transmission system to get the power around. And uh, whether we like it or not, pylons are the most cost effective way to shift power around the country. Um, you start burying cables, you have to cool them, you have to uh, do all sorts of things. Um, so pylons are what we're stuck with. These little things and these big things <clears throat> are the transformers that I talked about. And without going into too much detail, we always transform to as high a voltage we can work at as possible because that minimizes our transmission losses. If you transmit at low voltage, you get a lot of losses. So typically we might be half a million volts coming out of this transformer and um, maybe stepping up or stepping down uh, eventually uh, to our uh, 240 volts. So this system, for instance, might be 33,000 volts transmission system and then stepping down and feeding down to uh, a farm or a small village or something through that transformer. These pylons will be working probably at a quarter of a million or half a million volts typically. So it's all a very complex um, uh, and uh, complicated system and what's uh, interesting is that with the renewable power that's coming in the system has to be adaptable because we're no longer shifting power from a big power station looks like a nuclear action in that picture, um, to our homes, but we're shifting power from wind turbines all around the country, uh, solar power generating systems, storage systems that are coming in, etc. So it's all getting wonderfully complex and interesting. As the, uh, as network, uh, as the um, electricity network people say, it's a challenge, but I'm sure they'll meet it. So that's, where our electricity comes from, um, it's a, as I say, it's a changing picture. We've got uh, we've got um, uh, Sizewell C maybe or Sizewell D, whatever it is, coming along soon. On the one hand, we've got our wind generators. On the other hand, we've got people trying to find ways of storing it uh, so that uh, so that uh, make to make the system work better. It's all an interesting challenge. Brings us round to what happens to electricity when it comes into our houses. Well. Um, I just want to sort of run through the basic principles of electricity in the home. Um, I talked about all these different voltages that are, are, are um, being used to transmit and generate and all this kind of stuff. When it gets to us, it's 230 or 240 volts typically, as you probably know. And that's what's on your socket. So that's sort of what we're going to talk about. Um, and the first, first issue is, is as we come into the house, it's all about safety anyway. Um, conductors aren't perfect. Um, they warm up a little bit when you use them. Those, those pylons, the cables run pretty much hand hot because of the losses. And if we get a very high current flow through the cables, then this is what happens, it burns out. This situation is very, very dangerous because of course it can start a fire. So if we get a, uh, if we get a, an overload on the socket, uh, the cables can get hot and burn out. It's also complicated because different circuits use thicker or thinner cables. If you've got a lighting circuit, you don't need to have a thick cable. If you've got a cooker or a shower, you do need a thick cable. So different cables, different, uh, uh, different uh, um, load capabilities and different overload capabilities and they must all be protected from overload or short circuit. So how do we do that? Well, um, if there's a short circuit, we get this burning out effect, whether it's a battery or whether it's um, a power coming into your house. That's, um, that's what, we're, uh, what we're concerned with here. So how do we protect it? Well, uh, we have, if we have a, a short circuit and a high current flowing, then if we have a very small piece of wire, then that piece of wire will get hot very quickly and burn out before anything else in the circuit burns out. 
So we've got this massive current flowing around this loop here, nothing to stop it, nothing to limit it, except the wire resistance and this fuse. Um, and the fuse blows the wire, the, melt, the wire melts very quickly and opens the circuit for you automatically. And this is what fuses look like. Um, these fuses are the ones you get inside a plug. Inside here, there's a little piece of wire. These fuses uh, you'll often see inside other pieces of equipment. Uh, and these fuses are the ones you get in cars. And this one's rated for 30 amps. This one's rated on the plug for 13 amps. And that means that these are safe to operate at these currents. The current goes higher than the fuses will eventually blow. As it says there, glass or plastic carriers make it easier to pull them out and plug them in. So with the power coming into our house, we need to protect our, our, our systems. And this is an old style fuse box. And what you had here were plug-in uh, sort of um, carriers, which had little bits of wire um, across them. And when the fuse blew, you had to unplug these, reconnect reconnect them with the right sort of wire and plug them back in and the idea obviously is that if there's an overload this piece of wire gets hot and fails and uh, and protects the the overall circuit replaced by um, consuming units as they're called which have molded case circuit breakers in them now a molded case circuit breaker here looks like a switch but it's actually, you might say, an electrically operated switch. What it has is, you know that if you push electricity uh, in a coil like this, you can, um, you, you can uh, get uh, a, a magnetic field. And if, if that current is very high, then the magnets will open the circuit automatically. So it's not a very good drawing really, but you can imagine if these switch, these if this switch connection is mag is magnetic and this creates a magnetic field, then this will pop open and uh, open the circuit. So it's a magnetic system of uh, of fusing, if you want. And the great thing about a circuit breaker is, of course, it's resettable. You just have to reclose the switch. So it pops open with high current and you reclose it. And of course, when I say resettable. You can switch these things back on when the fault is fixed. Now, very occasionally they will trip for what seems like no apparent reason, but in practice, um, you usually have to find out what it is that's caused these things to trip, and we'll come to that. So, as I said, different circuits need different powers. Lights don't use much power, even less now they're LEDs. Um, sockets need a bit more power. You plug in a hairdryer or a heater or something, and cookers and showers uh, need need more power still. So we use different thicknesses of wire to wire these things up. So we need to have uh, light wiring for lights and heavy wiring for cookers, and we need to protect that protect those things accordingly. So when we look in our consumer unit, what we see is a row of these uh, circuit breakers. We see a main switch as well, and we see an RCD, and I'll talk about the RCD in a minute. The main switch obviously switches the whole house off. So uh, if you operate that switch, all these switches are normally up, by the way, when everything's working. If you open that switch, that's simple. That's a straightforward mechanical switch. These are the molded case circuit breakers. You can see they've got numbers on here. I hope you can see anyway. Uh, this one says B6, this one says B16, this one, this one, this one says B32. Those are the amperes at which they're safe to work. So the six ampere circuit, if you notice, has got relatively thin wires coming out of it. That'll be a lighting circuit. So we've said six amps, that's enough for the lighting in the house. 16. That might be um, some sockets, might be downstairs sockets, upstairs sockets, something like that. Slightly thicker wire. 32 here, I think that's probably thicker wire. That might be a cooker or it might be a, uh, it might be a, uh, a, um, a shower unit or something like that. So in a consumer unit, you've got some 
uh, MCCBs for the, for the lighting, you've got some for the sockets, and you've got some for heavy circuits, and you might like cookers and, uh, and showers. And you might have one for the garage as well, so the garage can be, uh, can be protected, for example, as well as the main switch. And you can see typical um, wiring system, uh, really messy and horrible, and all going off to your various sockets and circuits there, that's typical. So let's look at, uh, what, when we look a bit more closely at the wiring, we'll see obviously that there are two sets of, uh, two lots of wiring. We have to ha make a circuit. So there's a go and return. There's a live and a neutral. <clears throat> but when you, I was talking about AC, um, there's no difference between the live and neutral because they both go positive and they both go negative. Um, so why do we talk about live and neutral? Well, we talk about live and neutral because we have an earth. And the earth is a, a third connection that um, sometimes called a ground, that's what they call it in the US. The, uh, the ground, uh, the earth is, is a safe connection that is connected literally to the ground. It, quite often there's a post driven into the ground near to your house or, or locally where the, uh, the earth is connected. And if we connect our metal points to that, uh, our metal parts of that, then there's no way that those metal parts can go live because they're connected to ground and ground is safe by definition. We touch it all the time. Sort of thing. Now, in order to give additional protection, what we normally do is we tie the earth wire to the so-called neutral wire, one of the AC wire. So when we're wiring up a house, quite often we'll use this cable and we'll have to insulate that wire um, and that's how electricians work. Or we'll have a cable where we have an earth wire, uh, which is already insulated, and the neutral and the live wire. And these are standard colorings uh, throughout Europe now. Used to be um, red for live, black for neutral, green for earth, but uh, you'll find that in an older house, like that uh, consumer unit, for instance. So here we are, we've got a, a separate earth wire, and we've got our live and our neutral. Now, why have we done that? Well, let's look at um, a rather stylized uh, washing machine or something here. We've now got three wires coming to it. We've got the liver neutral wire, which go to the motor, to the electronics, and all the stuff that's running inside the machine. We've now got an earth wire that's tied to the metal, okay? And we've tied the neutral and the earth together. That's not something you do, that's something the electrician does when, when, when it's put together. There are slightly different ways of doing these things, but basically this is how it's done these days. Neutral and earth tied together at the meter or at the consumer. Now, what happens if there's a short from live to earth? Well, if there's a short from live to earth, it's effectively a short from live to neutral. So it's a short circuit. So hopefully a fuse will blow or something. So, uh, but it's not current that's flowing through the neutral wire. It's flowing from live round down to earth. That means that there's an imbalance between the current that's flowing down the live wire and the one that should go down the live and back down the neutral. In other words, in normal operation, current goes down the live through the motor or whatever it is it's doing and then back up the neutral. So the current in the live is equal to the current in the neutral. But when we make a short circuit, the current goes around that loop like that through the earth and the RCD detects that and trips. So what's an RCD? Well, it's a residual current detector. It's detecting the odd, the imbalance in the currents between the live and the neutral. And again, you've got sort of an electromagnet again, but now you've got a, uh, a live uh, coil and a neutral coil. And as long as these two are uh, balanced, there's no magnetic field. But as soon as we get a short circuit to Earth, then this uh, magnetic field suddenly appears and opens the contacts. So here's our RCD. It's a bit more complicated inside than an MCCB. And it's even got a test button to make sure that it's working because it's, uh, it's a safety unit, it means that if there's a current flow to Earth, it could be going through you. 
not through the metal of the of the a washing machine if you've touched a live contact and you're also you also got a connection to earth suppose you've got your hand on the washing machine and you somehow touched a live contact that current flows through you fortunately the the residual current detector will detect that and it will open the trip above all do not try this at home because the rcd might be faulty for some reason it's not a good way to test these things. Use the test button if you want to try it out. So RCDs are, have been around for 40, 50 years, something like that. And now they're just part of what's in your consuming room. What that means is that when we go, let's skip ahead a minute. What that means is when we go back to our consuming unit and we're thinking about protection and thinking about the faults, then um, it's quite possible that the RCD will trip open as well, or instead of one of the um, NCCBs. So uh, that's another item to look at. And the R in my experience, the RCD often trips if you get something like uh, a, a, a sudden overload, like a, an old fashioned bulb blowing or something, always seems to open these up. Um, and um, we'll talk about brief. We'll talk briefly about how to sort of troubleshoot that in a minute. Just going back, I flicked over this uh, this foil. Um, so, if you've got equipment that has got uh, metal parts on it, it's almost inevitably going to have an earth connection on it. And if it if it hasn't, it should have really. But a lot of equipment doesn't really need to be uh, have that extra cable connected to it, uh, providing that it's double insulated. I think we've moved on with a double insulated symbol, but basically, um, if something's double insulated, it's either got plastic uh, casing or it's got um, metal work that is very well separated from the inside conductors. That's why it's called double insulated. And consequently, of course, anything like a hairdryer, which has got a plastic case on it, or um, you know, a laptop charger, all these things, they tend to have two cables and not three cables. Um, there are other reasons for having earth cables, um, but basically uh, don't be worried if your equipment hasn't got an earth cable on it. Uh, it's probably because it's double insulated and basically it's uh, much, much less likely that the, uh, the equipment becomes alive or obviously it's a plastic case as we just talked about. I, I, okay, I so really add, um, add to that, Martin, that, that that symbol will appear on, on your appliance. Uh, are usually on, on the base or, or uh, molded into the actual um, body of it uh, if it's a plastic casing. So uh, if it doesn't have an earth, check that it's got that. If it doesn't have that and it doesn't have an earth, um, again, it should, should be okay, but uh, if it's mostly plastic. Yeah, sometimes it'll say class two insulation or something like that as well, but that, that's, the, that's the symbol that, uh, that's on it, that's right. Okay, so um, that's, that's our um, consumer unit. Um, if we draw up the consumer unit, and this time I've used the right colors basically, um, that's what the circuit looks like. And I won't go into the detail, but you, you, you get the idea. Here's the power going out to the sockets, protected by the MCCBs, and also by the residual current uh, detector. Here's the power going to the cooker, that's, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not protected because it's, uh, it's much higher power. And here are some other, uh, some other connections that are, that are there. There's the big main switch, which breaks the circuit uh, coming in from the supply. There's the meter, the electricity meter, uh, which will measure all the power that you're using. And last but not least, here's the main fuse. Now, you've got all this protection here, so why do you need a main fuse? Well, you've got to protect in case there's a short circuit in the meter or perhaps in this switch or something. Because if you had a short circuit here, it would uh, damage all the wiring coming into your house. So there's another fuse here. And that fuse is set to be pretty big because you don't want it to fail because it's sealed. And the reason it's sealed is because if you're fairly smart, you could open up that and take the wires out and jump around the meter. And that would uh, save you an awful lot of money, might give you an electric shock in the process, but um, the electricity board have thought of that, so they, um, so they, 
place up. Electricity board, what am I talking about? That's about 40 years old, isn't it? Whoever your district network operator is, sort of thing. Okay, so that's how, that's basically how your wiring in your house works. Why have I brought it this far? Well, uh, gosh, we're running a bit tight on time now. I um, just want to talk very briefly then about um, how stuff works around the house. We've got all this electrical stuff in the house. Just want to say quickly how it works and the power it uses. Um, so we'll, we'll just run through these a little bit more quickly than I might like otherwise. Fridges, air conditioners and heat pumps, they're all the same thing. They all work on the same principle. Um, an air conditioner is um, a, a heat pump that's running the other way around, you might say, because you want the hot bit of it, you don't, uh, you, you want the cold bit of it, sorry, and with a heat pump, you want the hot bit. Fridges are the same, they all work the same way. We have a compressor, we compress the gas, that gives it energy, which makes it hot. So this bit of the system is hot, um, and that's where we get our heat from if we want it. So if we're heating, like with a heat pump, this bit is hot. It's, uh, by this point, uh, it's turned into a liquid because of the pressure and the lower temperatures, and then it comes around through a, uh, through another um, nozzle system. And at this point, the liquid again evaporates into a gas. Now, when liquid evaporates, it draws in heat. In other words, it goes cold. And this is the same effect you get if, you're got, if you've got wet hands and it's windy, your hands get cold because the water's evaporating and it's cooling you down. So this is a source of coldness, if you want. Um, so, to the, to a strange way of expressing it, but this is this is where you get your cold from. So if you're running an air conditioner, this is the bit you're interested in. And if you're running a heat pump, this is the bit you're interested in. And these two can swap over very easily simply by reversing the action of the compressor. That's why if you buy an air conditioner unit, it's also got a, a, a warming setting on it. The key point about heat pumps is that for every kilowatt of power that you put into the compressor, you get two or three kilowatts of heat out. And that's not, well, more than three kilowatts of heat actually these days. And that's not true of a straightforward heater that you have in your house. You put in a kilowatt of electricity, you get a kilowatt of heat out. Not so with a heat pump. That's why heat pumps are considered, uh, you know, much more um, environmentally friendly and why they, um, and why they, uh, they're, well, they obviously used a lot less power for the same amount of heat, basically. So uh, if we look at uh, a fridge, for instance, it's the same thing. We've got a compressor down the bottom, and this is what they look like. You'll see that sitting in the bottom of, of your fridge. We've got a cold part, and then we've got a hot part. And the hot part is the condenser coils at the back. And uh, that's why it's important to keep your fridge somewhere as cool as possible, because the uh, the uh, condenser coils need to uh, need to shift heat basically and why it's important not to block the airflow over these because again that will affect the efficiency of your fridge. Air conditioning unit you've got a, a cold part and a hot part or if it's air conditioning a cold part and a hot part. There's a pump and a compressor in here and there's an evaporator systems in here. This is a commercial uh, heat pump uh, heat pump system that increasingly is being used for um, for heating houses. Still, quite an expensive solution. Um, so that's very quickly um, fridges, air conditioners, and heat pumps. They're all the same family. The liquid they use, of course, um, uh, in the past was Freon 12, uh, which was found to be an ozone um, damaging chemical. That's why when you take your fridge for the tip, you mustn't put it on the tip. And you've probably you may have to pay to, to have it dealt with because they have to remove the liquid very carefully from the old fridges. I won't talk about old-fashioned lights, but just to mention LED lights, uh, LED lights are um, electronic, so they have converters built into them. The 240, 2, 230, 240 volts um, AC isn't suitable for them, so they've actually got electronics in here to bring the voltage down. 
Perhaps I'm preaching to the converted, but LED lights are 10 times as efficient as incandescent lights. Um, rip out your incandescents, put them in. And they're even twice as efficient as compact fluorescence. Uh, you know, the compact fluorescence with sort of first generation of low energy lights. It's not worth ripping your compact fluorescence out and replacing them with LEDs, but just wait till they fail and let them swap them out. LEDs have a much longer life than uh, any uh, um, than uh, old incandescents, of course. They're 40, 50,000 hours or something. I've had some for, uh, I've had 10 or 15 now for eight years and none of them have failed. So that's a pretty good gun. Um, electronics in the house. We won't talk about how electronics work, but as I say, the electronics um, needs low voltage to operate from them. So they have these converters that are either built into the plug or are built into a little, um, a little uh, converter in here um, to produce a, a low voltage. Quite often the voltage is designed to charge a lithium battery. Lithium batteries come in 3.6 volts or so um, and multiples thereof. We talked about motors earlier. You'll see all sorts of different motors around um, in your house. Um, they tend not to use a tremendous amount of power. The washing machine motor is um, probably one of the biggest in the house, um, and that, that might be getting up towards 500 or 1,000 watts uh, when it's working, but it doesn't run for, for too long. Um, so there's all sorts of, uh, lots of, lots of equipment in your house. Um, I just want to um, sort of try and summarize then um, what uses power in your house. Um, I think this is quite important because, you know, people, switching off their radios and things to save power, um, you don't need to, it's not using a lot of power. Things that use power basically produce heat. And if you're using heaters, then they use quite a bit of power. So a room heater, for instance, um, up to three kilowatts for a sort of, a, you know, a powerful room heater. Hair dryers, they're not on for long, but uh, they can use one and a half or two kilowatts. So if you look at the cost of, the, of these heaters, well, if you boil a, a kettle, you don't have it on for long, so it doesn't use much power. It costs you a couple of pence. Same with drying your hair. I suppose it depends how much hair you've got. Um, cost me nothing to dry my hair, actually, um, but that's another story. Um, if you're cooking and you're cooking with electricity, then um, you know, it gets a bit more expensive. Um, the oven element is quite powerful, but it cuts in and out to, to keep a constant temperature. If you're heating a room with electricity, it's beginning to get expensive. If you've got a heat pump, then that's, a, that's different. But with a conventional heater, electricity is expensive way of heating, no doubt about it. Electric shower, not too bad. They're probably the most singly, single powerful things in the house, actually. They can be up to 10 kilowatts in an electric shower, but um, they, uh, they, they'll, uh, you don't have them on for long. So keep your showers short. And as it says here, a heat pump uh, will give you three times as much power for the electricity that goes into it. Sounds magic, but that's the way it is. Um, if we start going down in power, if you use a cooling fan or something, they don't use much power. They're 50 watts or 100 watts at maximum, so they don't use much power at all. Washing machine, use about a kilowatt hour of electricity in total. You've got some heaters in there these days um, because you just need to bring the water up. But again, if you don't use high temperature water, um, it's not too much of a problem. You're probably using electricity, a lot of electricity with your fridges and freezers. The problem is they sit there and they run all the time, switching on and off to keep, the, uh, to keep, the, to keep it cold. But they're doing that 24, 24 seven. They're running all the time. The mo when I say run all the time, they're, they're maintaining the temperature all the time, and they do that by switching the compressor motor in and out. There's a thermostat in there which is uh, switching it on and off. Nevertheless, typical freezer could cost you 10 pence a day, um, about 36 pounds a year on my calculation. So uh, if you've got that and if you've got a fridge, it, it, it's a significant chunk of your electricity. I measured my uh, freezer actually because I was thinking of changing it and basically it was using about three quarters of a kilowatt hour a day, which works out about 10 pence a day. So, uh, you know, things like this, it's, it's, it's all not too expensive, but of course we all know what electricity bills are, they all add up. 
when you get down to the little things, the electronics and the laptops and things, not much power at all. Um, so, you know, you can leave an LED on all night and you'll probably use less than one pence worth of electricity. Laptops don't really use much. Um, phone charge, virtually nothing. Um, your stereo, stuff like that. Again, it's, it's all very, very low power. Even televisions uh, don't use much power, especially the LED lit ones now. Um, not so much, uh, you know, not too expensive to watch television. Um, just a quick mention of standby power. A um, lot, of, lot of concern about switching off equipment um, because of the standby power. In the old days, uh, they used to use used to draw significant power in standby mode, you know, waiting for you to operate the remote. Um, we don't, uh, that's not a problem so much these days because since 2010, there's been regulations that say you can't have more than one watt going into your uh, equipment while it's on standby. So um, if you've got old equipment, then that'll draw a bit of power. I've got an old stereo that sits on top the uh, the wardrobe that I switch on to listen to the radio in the mornings. And um, that has a standby power of eight watts that I've measured because um, it's very old. Um, the television downstairs can sit on standby and use and uses less than a watt. So that doesn't cost you much at all. So a lot of talk about standby power. It's not, not a big issue in my opinion. You can get one of these things. In fact, I think we were giving them away at the, uh, at the um, uh, repair cafe, the uh, the tool um, the tool library. Um, to we've still got a couple them. left, but I think most of them went right. There are only a few pounds anyway, um, and you can measure the power um, coming out of that socket. Whatever. Okay, um, just touch touch fairly briefly on fixing stuff. I I don't want to spend too long on it because I don't want to encourage you too much to go away and. Um, trying to do major repairs, but there are a few things that we can think about um, with domestic stuff. Most domestic equipment is pretty reliable. Most of the things that goes wrong with it are very simple things that can get fixed. And um, that's certainly my experience working in a repair cafe. It's very unusual to find something that's, that's tricky. Obviously, you don't work on stuff while it's connected. I mean, that, that shouldn't even need to say that. And, you know, the whole process of, of repairing is about repairing, reusing, uh, and at the last instance, recycling. If we repair stuff, then that saves landfill, it saves manufacturing energy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, supply failure. Well, we're back to our consumer unit, except this time we got the cover on, so it's a little bit safer. Um, if your supply goes off, the first thing you want to do is work out if there's a power cut and is, there, if, is everything else working. So if everything is off completely, then you need to find out if there's a power cut. If not, um, start looking at these switches and seeing if any of these have tripped. If it's just where you've plugged in one piece of equipment and suddenly that's pulled the power out, then it's most likely that you'll find one of these has flipped down and probably one of the RCDs as well. If that's happened, unplug what you plugged in and try and push these back up that'll tell you what it is. Perhaps it's the socket that's faulty. Try the other appliance in another socket. You know, this is, this is what we're doing here is doing some basic logical sort of deduction. You know, is it this socket? Is it this equipment? Is it this appliance? You know, moving stuff around. Um, as, it's, as it says here, all the switches here should always be up. That's, uh, that's um, where you're, that's telling you that your power is all coming in okay. Um, sometimes if you get a surge or something, the RCD or the MCCB will trip and it'll flick down, you'll see it. Um, and as it says there, unplug something you just plugged in and try again. Um, fuses. Uh, we talked about fuses on, on uh, supplies. There's fuses in, inside all UK plugs. You could try taking the, so if you've got a faulty appliance, you could try taking the fuse out and trying it in something else. Or um, if you've got a new fuse, try putting the, the, the new fuse in. Um, fuses usually blow for a reason, so don't be surprised if the fuse blows again. Um, you know, they don't, they don't normally sort of wear out and, and fail. Something, uh, something goes wrong. Fuses are rated in amps, and when you buy a 13 amp plug, it's usually got um, a 13 amps 
fuse in it. If you buy an appliance with a plug fixed on it, it may well have a smaller fuse in it because not many appliances use 13 amps. Even our cooker, even our kettle only uses 10 amps, so it's not a big deal. Uh, so if you've got a piece of electronics, it might have a three amp fuse in it or even a one amp fuse. Um, and you should always replace the fuse with the same value. Sometimes equipment's got an internal fuse in it. Not so much now, but uh, you know, I, I, I repaired a hi-fi recently um, that just had the internal fuse blown. And surprisingly, uh, when I replaced the fuse, it worked fine. So I don't know whether the guy had just been running it very loud or something and pulled the fuse, or whether the fuse had just sort of aged over many years. So you can check around fuses and things. Um, something we see a lot in the repair cafe are loose connections and broken cables. I mean, if you've got a hedge trimmer and you cut through the cable, you know pretty well what you've done there. That's a broken cable. But quite often, um, cables sort of seem to fail, particularly where they just come out the appliance, where you can flex it. Uh, sometimes, um, if it's got a plug on it, like a kettle, you can just replace the whole cable. If the cable's attached, um, sometimes you can go inside and just cut off the offending bit of cable and uh, you know, shorten it by a few, a few inches and rewire it. Um, or you can get someone else to do it if you're not confident to do it. Um, we do that all the time at the repair cafe. You, know, you plug something in, you waggle the cable, it, it's, you know, the light's flickering on it. Right, switch it off, unplug it, take the cover off, um, find out where the cable's connected, disconnect it, remove the cable, cut off, the three or four inches that uh, of where it's where it's loose and then rewire it something uh something you know anybody who's got a bit of experience there can do certainly don't throw the appliance away <laughs> um again connections um i get a lot of trouble with the, these connections on my on my more modern kettle um and you can you can do some things with these kettle contacts you can you can get these fixed you can I don't know if you can buy replacement ones. You can certainly buy replacement ones for specific kettles. Um, but, you know, it's a spring contact. Sometimes you can just um, ease the spring and get it working again. Um, don't do it if you're not confident. Get somebody else to do it. Um, sometimes you'll get a loose connection inside a plug and the plug will get hot. Now that might be a connection to the fuse or a wire. You see if a wire's dropped off or come loose or something. I I had a um I had my hedge trimmer that was I didn't cut through the cable, but it was really playing up and I took the cover off and the wire had actually sort of broken off with all the vibration internally and was just sort of touching occasionally. You can see things like that sometimes. So going back to our plug, if we look inside a plug, this is a, an old plug um, which, you, which is removable and replaceable. Sometimes these connections work loose. Um, it's always worth taking the back off and trying to tighten these screws up. Sometimes where the fuse plugs in, um, these connections show signs of burning where they're not properly connected. And on a, on a more modern plug where you can't take it apart, you can see this fuse connection has burnt and you can either then replace um, these connections, clean them up a bit and put the fuse back in, or you can cut the plug off and put a new plug on. Um, again, if you're not confident and don't want to do it, that's fine, get someone else to do it. I I'd do it for you, no problem. Can I, can I just ask really... a real quick one there? So yep. With the sealed plugs, um, what, what's the logic behind supplying it with a sealed plug? If you, if so for instance you just you could just cut it off and put a new one on why not just put start off with a with a, a regular plug that's easily maintained anyhow i think it's because they don't like people doing that you know i think i think you know they were uh, they found that when they you know when they supplied uh plugs and people tried to change them and this sort of thing they 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 made a complete mess of it um and obviously it's a lot safer to have a sealed plug because people can't stick their fingers in the back you know um, electricity is dangerous, you know, it is, it, it does need a bit of confidence to work on it, but it's not, it's not illogical, you know, it's not that complicated. Um, you know, people put these things together, that means that other people can take them apart and fix them, you know, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, um, that magic. Um, so yeah, I think that was, 
uh, it caused a big problem in the industries because um, you had to, you know, if you were exporting equipment, you had to fit French plugs or American plugs or whatever. Um, you had to think about that when you were when you were shipping them. Um, so just briefly then about taking stuff apart. Um, something we do in the repair cafe all the time is we try and take stuff apart to find out what's going on inside. Um, when people design stuff, they don't deliberately make it complicated. They make it as simple as possible. So it's relatively simple to take them apart. The thing that's difficult is finding out where the plastic clips are and which way they go. Um, it's finding out how to sort of get into it that's difficult. When you finally get into it, just make sure that you, you record everything. It's no good thinking, oh, I'll remember where that went, because you never do. Um, take photos, uh, you know, especially to record where the wires went and that sort of thing when you unplug. Don't lose the screws. Look for your loose wires and broken bits. And of course, go to YouTube. I um, had a dishwasher fail two or three years ago, um, and uh, it was a strange sort of fault. But I hunted around YouTube and I found three different explanations of what the problem was. That, you know, the explanation was the same, but it was done by three different people. And I was able to look at the best way to take it apart and the best way to replace the offending part. Someone's always done it before. You know, it's always there on YouTube. I thoroughly recommend that. And if you're not confident about it, get someone else to do it. Take him to the repair cafe. You know, I reckon we fix about 90% of stuff that comes in. And if there's not a repair cafe to you, find some nerd like me who's quite happy to uh, have a go at fixing these things, you know. So here's Kirill. I don't know what he's working on, but um, looks like it might be a vacuum cleaner, actually. They're the worst because they're dirty and dusty and horrible. But um, uh, a, mixing, a mixing machine or even, uh, or even a toy, we'll have a go at it. Okay, that's... Uh, that's all I wanted to say. So we've kept reasonably to time, I think. Um, just run over a bit on just over an hour or so. Uh, but my voice is going, so that's a good time to finish and a uh, good time to get any questions. So I'll um, I'll stop sharing if I may. Good. All right. Well, I guess it just uh, just remains to say thank you very much for Martin for joining us, and um, we'll, uh, we'll we'll see you again. It's, uh, it's been a, been a good workshop again. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. It's been good. I hope I can do some more. Yeah, we're definitely. Absolutely. We'll talk again, Chris. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Bye.